Today's class is offered to the general public by the BYU Family History Library. Our presenter is James Tanner, who has a, a great deal of background uh, uh, in uh, genealogy and has uh, a, a great knowledge of the family search programs and other uh, companion programs, uh, My Heritage. Uh, Jake, to put it shortly, James is like uh, genealogy 24-7. Uh, uh, every day, he, that's what he lives for, and uh, and it, it, we are grateful to have him with us and to, to uh, appreciate him for uh, sharing his uh, knowledge, uh, uh, especially in this, uh, which is a very timely topic of the changes in family search. Uh, we appreciate him, and maybe he'll he will and trust he will enlighten us uh, with what's going on uh, at the best of his ability. Uh, I'll now turn the time over to, to, uh, to Elder Tanner for the presentation. Okay, but I will share my screen. Got to do one more thing first. Sorry for the second, two couple of second delay here. Okay, well, we talked about just before we came uh, officially online that this is about what's new on family search. Uh, I think I want to explain at the beginning that um, what I selected as what's new is uh, merely a selection because uh, as we were discussing uh, just before the, this presentation started, there's just constant change going on with uh, family search and practically every other program online. Uh, it's just the nature of technology that it continues to evolve and change. What I tried to select here with uh, what's new on family search were what I would call apparent things. Um, one of the one of the interesting facts about uh, most websites and in and family search is kind of runs into the, the common reel of what well, what's going on. And that is a lot of times family search will attach various promotional products or promotional uh, things that they're they're they they have at the moment uh, that then go kind of go away because as the time passes, for example, I'm going to talk today about the 1950 census. Well in 19 in 2022 this is going to be a big thing by 2023 it will not be a big thing <laughs> so basically uh this is one kinds of things where there are lots of things that we'll find on the on the family search website that perhaps will not carry over past uh, a current project to uh, to check the artificial intelligence uh, indexing of the 1950 census Okay, well, let's jump into it. I think it's uh, kind of get moving here. Uh, first of all, uh, you may, as you, if you get into uh, Family Search, as you sign into FamilySearch.org, you will find rather quickly that uh, your startup page is is familiar, but quite different right now. And you will find also that if, as you register and begin using the program, that you will have sort of a custom startup page. Uh, well, that custom startup page is going to change again. Uh, and it's getting a little bit, mm, I don't know if you'd call it um, simplified, but it is a different design and different organization of the title page. So what if, whatever you're used to using on that title page, uh, it's possible that some of it will still be there, but some of it may disappear. And what I would suggest when you find something like this that uh, you say, well, I wish I really had that, I would go to what they call the communities link. If you go up on the top of the screen, uh, there's a little bell, uh, question mark, excuse me, that says um, that you can click on and then you'll have a link to the communities. And one of those communities that's a discussion group would be the communities on the family tree. And this is where you can give feedback directly to family search. And, and contrary to what it may seem like, yes, they do monitor those and they are aware of what is being said. Um, and, and a lot of times the, um, 
the changes that are made are made because not necessarily because of what you personally or what I personally do with the family tree, but what people generally throughout the world do with, with family tree. And what may make a lot of sense to you here, if you're here in the United States or if whatever country you're in, whatever localized kind of use you have of the family tree may not be the same as it is for those who live in across the world. So recognizing that, then there are definitely going to be a number of changes. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is, and, and all of these are on the familysearch.org website, not so easy to find. And uh, sometimes you have to look for things uh, directly using a search. If you go to Google search, you'll, and, and you realize this, that everything on the family search website with the exception of information about individual living people and a few other areas of, um, of information, uh, primarily dealing with, uh, with things about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are not available, but everything else on the, um, on the website is searchable by Google. So if you want to find it and you get frustrated and you say, well, I knew this was here, then you can start searching with Google search and you'll find uh, the links to uh, virtually everything. And this is the case with the Family History Library webpage. This is the main webpage for the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. And it is, um, as far as I can tell, haven't found a link directly from any pull down menu or anything on, uh, on the familysearch.org website, although it is on the familysearch.org website. So um, that's the only way I can tell you to get to it is to do a search for the Salt Lake Family History Library. Then you'll be right there, bing, there'll be a connection to it. When you do that kind of a search, let me give you a little bit of a caution though. Look at where the, the, the address of what you're finding, because a lot of people talk about the Family History Library and you may spend some time looking at other programs or other, or other websites. And so it's very important to, uh, when you do a Google search is look at the address that comes up. Does it say familysearch.org forward slash family history library, whatever or does it say some other organization or some other link? So once you've done that, then you're, you're fine. Now, one of the things I wanted to highlight was the research help that's available from the Family History Library. Now, this is different than the Brigham Young University or the BYU Family History Library. Not only are they different, but they're in different cities. Uh, BYU Family History Library is in Provo, Utah, about 45 miles south of Salt Lake City. And uh, the large, well-known family history library in Salt Lake City is in Salt Lake City. So now what we're going to do is uh, look at what they have for research help. And this is another family search. It says right up at the top, family search, uh, research help, um, a part of the uh, part of the website. And what you can do with the the Salt Lake version of the research. Uh, help is you can sign up for a online genealogy consultation. It's a free 20 minute scheduled uh, Zoom connection person to person with uh, one of the uh, volunteer or even employees actually from, uh, from the Family Search Library in Salt Lake City. Uh, some of us at the BYU Family History Library have been doing this now, uh, some of us for over a year, we started not in this year at RootsTech, but last year in 2021 at RootsTech. And uh, I have been we're doing this um, as on the basis and, and uh, have been participating for uh, two, two hour sessions a week. So I have about eight people a week uh, that I deal, that I am going to help and that I help online. Uh, it's interesting from my perspective is that well, who the people I'm helping and have been helping now for a year is about 90 uh, plus percent, 95 percent is my good guess, uh, in Spanish and about 100 percent of finding the immigrant. 
um, it is uh, a very, very uh, obviously uh, prof uh, problem that, that is faced by every single genealogical person who almost no matter where they live, unless they happen to live in their ant, you know, ancient homeland, it's very likely, and especially for anyone who lives in, uh, in, in the United States or in, for a lot of the people who live in the United States, they will either go back to the native populations or they will go back to an, to an immigrant. And uh, ultimately, of course, if you, if you follow uh, migration patterns, uh, everyone in the, in the two American continents is, is, call, is technically called an immigrant. But these things are just fabulous. And uh, uh, you can get things done, you can get questions answered. Um, most of my questions that I have fielded over the past year have been, um, uh, I would say, in the uh, new learner to intermediate category. I get very few complicated ones. Okay, but you go through the process, you select your area of research, and then you're matched up with someone who can, uh, who has that kind of a background. Um, okay, I want to give some equal time, however, in this case, and that was uh, the, the BYU Family History Library also has virtual online help. And uh, that's up here on the BYU Family History Library website. Uh, the differences are, are twofold. One, uh, we aren't necessarily working with people who have volunteered for a particular area. We're talking at the BYU Library with all of our uh, volunteer missionaries who have uh, uh, a variety of different language and, and research backgrounds. And so we will match whoever calls in up with someone who uh, we anticipate would be able to help and provide them with the support they need. Uh, the second major thing is that we're not limited to 20 minutes. Uh, we're more freeform, and uh, you may have to make an appointment with an expert, you know, we call them experts at the, the BYU Family History Library during a time when they are available. Uh, so just calling in isn't necessarily going to get your question answered, but it may get you to someone ultimately who can help. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that for equal time purposes. So here's, here's what you do when you click on the virtual family help uh, link, is you have a, uh, a further link that says click here to join the missionary virtual desk. And the difference here is uh, you need to do this during the hours that the library is open because this is when the people are sitting there on the on the computer and then from there they can uh, they can get someone else to help one thing that you're going to notice immediately about the familysearch.org website if you start to look for anything is that the search pages have been redesigned and as a matter of fact they are in the process of being redesigned from the redesign and so you're going to see fields and things change. Now, one of the things that happens is that they've kind of gone with the ancestry model. Uh, if you're familiar with ancestry, you know that they have a very simple search area. And then if you click to more options or more details, you can have, you can fill in a lot of different things. And that's exactly the same thing that happens here. Uh, if you click on the more, more options, then you have a lot of different places. And so each of those different categories up there in blue, uh, you can click on those areas and get uh, and enter more information and detailed information. Just kind of a, uh, a mention of strategy from this point. Uh, it is always better to begin with less. Uh, if you're going to, uh, to do research uh, in any category on any of the large websites, in any Google or anybody else, it is really a, lot, a good idea to start out with uh, a minimal amount of information and then add information if you fail to find what you're looking for. So rather than, than be enamored with the blanks and filling in all the blank areas at once, which would probably end up with very few returns, very few responses to your search, you begin with a name, a date, and a place, 
And then if you don't find what you're looking for, then you can add in a spouse, a father, a mother, another person, a marriage, a birth, a desk, a residence, whatever, until you see. The other, the other side of it is, is that if you put in a small amount of information and you get a hundred, you get a million responses from the, from the uh, website, uh, family search, then uh, you're going to necessity have to, to focus in on a smaller area. Uh, I think it's always a good experience, though, to put in a last name and see how many different people there are uh, listed on the family search and the resources that are indexed on the family search website. Now, one more, one more uh, uh, caution here is um, that idea of indexed records. Family search uh, will only search those records that have been indexed. And uh, right now, that's only about 20% of all of the records that are on the familysearch.org website. Okay, this is, uh, this is another kind of interesting thing. Uh, Family Search has over 5,000 uh, individual locations around the world. During the pandemic, this has been a problem because many of those individual locations, they're called family history centers, have been closed for very obvious reasons. Uh, they're just now kind of opening up around the world. They're just barely starting to get going. And unfortunately, in some of the countries of the world, they're not. One of the things that this is interesting because um, uh, in order to get uh, the information from, uh, from the what are called the portals or the uh, they're calling premium content uh, at the family history centers are the, those programs that are available only in a family history center. And to get access to those on, um, on their computers may be limiting. For example, some of the family history centers only have one or two computers. So what happens if you haul your computer in there, you have to wait to use one of theirs and then you have to copy back and forth between your computer and their computer. Well, what they've, what they've done here is to give you a Chrome browser extension that lets your computer access the portal if you're sitting in a family history center. So you're actually having to use their uh, system anyway. It's not going to give you free access any place you are in the world right now anyway. Uh, it is basically... Um, some according to these this information. Uh, how do you get to this point? Um, there's a long browser extension, but it's available at the Chrome Web Store. So if you go to Chrome, uh, the Chrome Web Store, uh, you'll find this uh, uh, browser extension that will let you uh, use your computer in the Family History Center that may or may not work depending on the connection and uh, the the availability of the Wi-Fi and all sorts of other problems that that could be that cr you're always with, living with when you're trying to connect and use uh, someone else's computer. Now let's look at the 1950 U.S. Census. I thought when I was thinking through what was going to what I was going to use for this presentation, uh, there was just no connection. There was just no underlying theme other than the LUT theme that all this stuff is new or newer and that um, you should be able to, um, uh, to find this information uh, by searching around and particularly more easier by the Google search. Now the US Census Project and, and the, the basis of this was that uh, after 75 years, the United States Census has become available. Uh, 72 years, excuse me after the uh, United States census has become available, I'm getting con uh, confused with England. So now uh, in 2022, we have the 1950 census. And that of course made some of us feel really old because now we're in the census records and we've never been in census records. Okay, so now we're in the census records and um, we are, and we and our families and us as children, us old guys as children, uh, are, can look ourselves up. Now, that's the good news. The, the, the bad news is it was released exactly at like 12 a.m., 12 
you know, on, uh, on April 1st by the National Archives. Now the National Archives released it, but all they did was make a download of the, of the census available. So there's a whole, uh, whole bunch of places where the census has now appeared uh, and you, you can start to dig into it. Once again, I'm referring you to a Google search. If you do a Google search for 1950 US Census online, uh, you're going to come up with a list of the websites that presently have uh, the entire census. Uh, so far, it's uh, Family Search and Ancestry and My Heritage, and, and, and perhaps some others that are popping on. Um, the key here is that, that indexing the census is separate from the census. If you go to the National Archive, of course, the National Archive sites has a copy of the census. If you go to the National Archives site and try to search, you'll find out very quickly that their index is to the maps and to the locations and not to the individuals. So you're going to have to know, first of all, exactly where your people lived, and then you're going to have to figure out how that, which uh, enumeration district they were involved in, where they went out and did the counting. And so uh, it can get complicated. The advantage, of course, of index entire record is that you can go in with your names and do a search. So what happened? Well, Ancestry began the process some years ago uh, in developing and anticipating by developing a, uh, an artificial intelligence-based um, handwriting recognition program that would read the handwriting. And they used as examples the earlier census records. So they built it so that it would read the 1930, 1940, et cetera, censuses, and uh, hoping that that would help to give a, a head start on the, on the census when it was released. And so what's happened with this is that um, uh, uh, Ancestry and Family Search have joined in a partnership where they have, um, uh, where they agreed to uh, have Ancestry supply the, the context and the, the method uh, if Family Search would supply the volunteers. And that way they're both, they're both um, um, using the people, you, getting the advantage of, of, from both organizations. And what's happened is that uh, they've developed a program that allows you to check the accuracy of the um, handwriting recognition program. So you're, yeah, you look at and can do that. And they're involved in a in set of projects to review the names. And uh, there's two ways to get involved. Uh, one is through the regular indexing program. And secondly, it's through uh, review names, which uh, lets you correct on the screen the names that are um, uh, have been already indexed in a sense by, not indexed, not in just a sense, indexed by the artificial intelligence and writing recognition program. So you can go to get involved and then it will take you. And this is one case where there actually is a link to get involved and uh, on the family search website. So you're going to be able to uh, get involved quite directly. Uh, one of the things that's happened over the past uh, couple of weeks as uh, we've gotten into uh, the 1950 census is that they're getting overwhelming responses. And uh, as a matter of fact, within a matter of just a few days, uh, all of the census returns for some of the states had already been completed. And the um, ability of the of uh, ancestry and family search to pre to pre prep uh, the to prep the the information that was going to be uh, uh, reviewed uh, all of a sudden was not sufficiently fast to keep up with the the, the rate of, of time. Actually, um, some of the people that were involved, I've gotten reports from some of my friends that uh, have done as many as twenty thousand names already. One person. 20,000 names have checked that many names. And so when you have that kind of an overwhelming interest and in, in involvement, one of the reasons is that this is like 
light years easier than doing indexing. Indexing is, is, a, is a tremendous challenge, but this is simply a matter of looking at the name and deciding if it was the same one that was found by the, uh, by the handwriting recognition program. And so it's just much faster. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's easier because you can really get, and there's lots of, of complication, but there are whole layers of, of other opportunities to get involved. There's family project, there's all these different kinds of projects that are going on with the 1950 census. So it'll be, uh, it'll be continuing for quite some time. Uh, you can also, you, you can do all this on your desktop computer. So it's not something that, you know, is, is just a mobile app, but it's, uh, there's actually, you can, you can work with it on your desktop or, and this is what it would, basically what you're getting at. And I always mention that I've had people with who've done over 20,000 names. So you're getting a, a pop-up that gives you a, a, a suggestion from the handwriting recognition, and then you're given the name uh, as it's printed on or written on the census forms. So then you're, you're going to need to go work through that. Uh, each time at the bottom, you'll see there's some uh, possibilities of match, edit, and uh, unknown, and, and then there's some other procedures. These are actually being added as they go along, as they discover, oh, well, we should have added this. So they're, um, they're putting in more features and it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty slick and you can get through there, get through quite a few names. To do 10 names, which is kind of, or 20 names, uh, it is you know, a matter of just a very few minutes. And as I mentioned, there's a, a mobile app that you can put on your iPhone or your Android and work through the same, uh, the same information. Um, it's not that much harder to do on the mobile app than it is to do on, on uh, online. Although if you're like me and you, you know, your fingers can't really push on little tiny buttons, it, it may be a challenge. Okay, switching completely 180 degrees away from that, uh, we have a new way to search for books. Uh, for a long time, uh, books have been sort of the unknown extra stuff that's sitting out there in uh, family search. But family search books has been out there for a very long time. And what's happening with the books is that these books are being um, digitized and used and analyzed by optical character recognition. So optical character recognition Optical character recognition or OCR will give you, uh, will let the computer read printed text like newspapers and books, uh, anything that's printed in a sense, not just printed by hand, but printed. And it will also um, allow you to um, uh, immediately search all of that information. So in other words, you don't just look for names in books, you can look for anything you want to that could be in a book. How many books are there? There's well over 500,000 genealogy books, family histories, maps, yearbooks, and more that have been uh, digitized and are, and are subject to OCR. That's the good news. What's the bad news? Well, a lot of those books are uh, subject to copyright and they're not searchable word for word. I would encourage anyone who has any connection to a family genealogy book. If someone in your family has published a book uh, and put it up and has it about the family and it involves genealogy, I can tell you from personal experience that you cannot make money selling a genealogy book to your family. Uh, if, you if you can, it's a very unusual book, but most of these books end up in boxes and basements or in storage areas. And so the idea here is that you should release the copyright, the, the author, the, the, the person who created the work should uh, release that to the public domain, allowing Family Search to put that book online and allow everybody to search it and use the information. Okay, so there's uh, some very good reasons and, and what's happening. In addition, you can donate a book directly to Family Search, and this for the first time. Uh, 
this information is, is uh, more readily available of how to submit a book and how to donate it and how to have it put online so that it's um, uh, able to be searched by anybody in the family who wants to go online and search the book. And I would suggest that this is an extremely good place to go look for information, depending on where your families come from, what kind of background they have, you may find that people wrote books. You say, well, this book's old. And my answer is yes, good, because when it was written is when the uh, information was fresh and the, and the people that are written are being written about were probably alive and most of the information was gotten was obtained firsthand. So, uh, and I would just kind of give another kind of side note here that really has nothing to do with family search directly, but uh, there is a, the, the biggest repository, the largest collection of these records is now over 34 million books on the, the website that's called archive, just A-R-C-H-I-V-E dot O-R-G. And if you're not familiar with archive.org, you have just no idea how many different books you can use. The difference with archive.org and family search is that if you find the book to be uh, copyrighted on family search, you go to the arts, you can look for it on archive.org. And there's a group, very good possibility that even if it's copyrighted, you will get access to the book because you can check the books out for up to two weeks. So you wanna do that with a library that has 34 million books. It's very, very near future archive.org will have the largest collection of books in the world. So you, you might want to uh, look into that. James, okay. there's a couple of questions you may want to answer. Sure. Before we, uh, one of them is, is someone checking the results that referring to the 1950 census like they do in indexing? No, there's no, there's no arbitrator. There's no review. This uh, is the review where we are acting as the arbitrators. The second one was regarding older United States census. Is there a website that lets us view the original census page, not the transcription copies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the National Archives webpage, all of those records, the, the digital copy of the records are up on at least the three websites I mentioned, Family Search, Ancestry, and um, MyHeritage right now. And there'll be more within probably, you know, I. I get notice of some, but I have to go search occasionally. And so I'm, you know, it's not like everybody sends me a note when they get something done. The last one was I did a family book, donated it to the uh, Salt Lake City Family History Library. It is online, but I cannot get into it. I put no right. restrictions or copyright on it. How do I get permission to see it? You need to contact them and make sure that they did get the, re the, the paperwork it's also a matter of timing. It can take them some considerable time to process the books. My original book, which I emphatically said was my great grandmother's book um, about the Jarvis and Overson families. And um, I did it and it took them three years to get it online before it was accessible. So I don't know. You know, I just, I can't, I can't say what's going on right now but I would certainly call up and talk to the book digitation, digitizing section at the Family History Library in Salt Lake and ask the question. And if you want to, you can contact me. I'll help you get in touch with whoever we need to. Yeah, that's the questions I think up to this point. Okay, well, okay. Now, one of the things you probably noticed is that there's what's called a discovery page for every one of the individual entries uh, in the family tree. Um, there's some logic behind this, and the logic is that it makes people aware of the, in a more kind of con concentrated fashion, uh, the information that's available about this person. There's a couple of things, though, that are kind of disconcerting about it. And one is it's kind of another place to check or look. And um, if you change the information on the original person, on the person shown, it doesn't always show up immediately. So you basically are getting, uh, perhaps in some cases, 
uh, where there's been changes made or additions or whatever, uh, you're not getting the latest information. But the other problem with it is, is that it's somehow, uh, from a lot of people's standpoint, it gives sort of a seal of approval to the information that's there. Like here we have the life summary of Lloyd Parkinson. Uh, you can go into another person, not my, great, my, my grandfather, but you can go into other people who, um, who have, uh, say for instance, a number of children listed and you go there and you say, well, they got 10 kids listed and he really only had three. So this is the problem, is that this, this is not endorsed um, cast in stone information. This is simply a, uh, a, a repetition site. Anything that's on that original profile page shows up here. And it's not, there's no, there's no uh, extra amount of information or anything that uh, uh, gives you more insight than, than the, the names and dates and the figures that are actually on the, uh, the first page, your profile page. As far as things like world events and timeline, uh, that's always been, that's been available for quite some time uh, that, that you could have uh, on the profile pages, there's been a link to a timeline. Uh, you can add in more world events. There are some things coming that um, are probably uh, going to be very helpful in that regard and in getting more information out. But just to be aware that this is now uh, sort of an extra page and it's, and it's called the, um, no, just, I'm sorry, it went right out of my head, about. It's the about page. Now, if you click on the profile, they'll have a link to about and that'll come to this discovery page. Okay, next. Um, Changes do not occur on the FamilySearch.org website without growing pains. And uh, one thing that you may have run into is uh, the Family Search catalog giving you a response that says we're unable to display certain results due to technical, et cetera. So when I, uh, my suggestion is that few minutes is not really a few minutes, it's just a few seconds. So if you keep reloading the page on about the second, third or fourth reload, you probably come up with getting through. Now, why were these things happening? Uh, it, it helps to know the background of what's going on. And I'll get into a little bit more in a few minutes, but the background is that family search is acquiring records at a phenomenal rate, millions and millions of records a year. And the process of indexing and cataloging those records is, is challenged. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a moment, of, a few minutes ago, uh, the number of indexed records is only about 20%. Well, you only add another 20% of records that are in the catalog. So we'll begin, I'll talk in a minute about where all of that comes from, what it happens. Okay. But you may get this as, as because of the, the multitude of changes. Now, there are a lot of ways to get involved uh, in Family Search, and uh, one of these is from the Family Search blog, and that's available at this one. Actually, has a link. If you go all the way to the bottom of the pages, like your startup page for Family Search, you'll see some menu items down there, including about and a few things like that. And one of those is is uh, the blog. And if you go to the blog and you can find uh, this article on Get Involved, easier way, like I mentioned earlier, look for Get Involved Family Search on Google or on your search engine, and you'll probably find this page. That's how I found it. And basically, there's all sorts of ways to get involved. You can help by improving place names, uh, going through and standardizing names, you can do uh, uh, improve the record hints uh, and uh, coming up with possible duplicate selections. You can do family search indexing. You can grow your family tree and help to add individuals and families. You can work as a technical writer. Uh, you can use do family search user testing, which is basically one of the things I mentioned uh, at the beginning that. Uh, uh, they will send you a request to look at something that they're proposing. 
And you can also do community translation if you happen to be a native language speaker of a language other than English. So they want you to be able to translate English into your native language, not something you learned in school. So they'll ask you if you're a native language speaker. You can also, this is another kind of a side area, you can see your contributions over the last few years. So you can see how many uh, types of information, sources, memories, and people that you've added to the FamilySearch website over time. And uh, this is either something you're kind of like competing with yourself. And if you can, um, like you always wanna say, well, I gotta, you know, I've done, four years over 2000, so maybe I should try to do that this year. Well, depending on what kinds of circumstances you're in, um, you probably may or may not be able to do that. Um, this is some of the contributions I've done, but you'll notice a big dip in 2018, which is when we were digitizing records for family search, which were not counted in all these, by the way. And so even though we added probably uh, a few hundred thousand records to the Family Search website, uh, that was not part of what was being contributed. <coughs> and that's on the uh, uh, on the Family Search uh, website when you go to um, a, an individual, when you're in the family tree and you can see this link to my contributions. There's also a new area of family search called family groups, and you can uh, join together with descendants or people who are related or have a particular specific interest and create a family group or create a group. And uh, then there's some ways of communicating between those groups. Uh, I happen to have gotten into uh, one of my great great grand great 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 grandparents groups, uh, the George Jarvis and, and prior Jarvis group descendants. You can see right now there's about 111 people in that group, and it's turned out to be pretty interesting to see uh, who's there and what they're uh, what they're there. So, and it may end up, by the way, this one may end up with a sort of a huge mega Jarvis reunion sometime in the future, because this would give us a way of, of organizing that <clears throat> and getting a lot of people involved. So you can create that group and uh, go ahead and, and, and do that kind of thing. There are some um, additional uh, opportunities for the groups if, if the groups are, um, if you are registered through your um, membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, by the way. Um, new memories overview. Um, you may have, uh, you may go directly to your gallery a lot and not look at the overview, but there are uh, some, some things uh, that are, that are um, available on the overview part under the memories tab. And it, it bears uh, looking at and searching at it. Under the activities tab on the familysearch.org menu, uh, you'll find uh, a lot of family history activities, all sorts of things. Uh, a lot of these are mirror image mirrors. I mean, I mean, well, reproductions in on a desktop basis of of apps or or, or programs that are available in the uh, in the discovery locations. Uh, the physical discovery locations uh, that are from Family Search, such as the one that's in the Family Search Library uh, and the Family History Library in Salt Lake. Uh, there's one in um, up in Washington State. There's one in Mesa now, in Mesa, Arizona, at the Mesa Temple Visitor Center. Uh, these discovery centers have some activities, and these are are similar activities on your desktop. So they're, they're, uh, some of them are quite interesting. One of the things that is very important to understand, and this is what I alluded to a moment ago, and we, my, my wife and I, Ann and I, take the opportunity to tell people about this every time we get a chance. And so we're gonna throw it into almost everything. And that is that FamilySearch has three categories of records. They have records that have been indexed, 
records that have been cataloged but are not yet indexed. And then they have records that are not indexed or cataloged. And these images, the third category are called images. And when you click on the search tab up there, you can search uh, for images, second item, second, second item on the search tab. I would uh, encourage everyone to explore this. So let me just explain. When you have, again, you have 20% that are indexed. That means out of one, only one out of every five records on family search are searched when you do a name search. So you're not going to find uh, a lot of the, th the information that's there by simply searching for names. And when you go into the catalog and search by place and turn up a catalog entry, you're only adding another 20%. So the 60% that are left are what's in this huge pile called images. And you can watch this actually from this website, from this web page. You'll see that calendar with 4,840,234, I mean, 844,234,856 images. It will can, it'll be incrementing all day long, all night long, every day. That's because that's keeping up with the number of records that are being added to the family search pile. And as they get indexed and as they get cataloged, they'll move out into the index and catalog. But meanwhile, these are only searchable by place. And I would <clears throat> very much encourage you, and uh, both Ann and I have posted, <clears throat> excuse me, um, presentations just recently in the next couple of weeks uh, about how these records, where the records are and where they're organized. And the two uh, uh, presentations are both called, where are all the records on family search? So if you go to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel, you should find two more videos, a short one and a long one that goes into explaining this in detail. Um, Roots Tech by Family Search, it is technically part of familysearch.org. And so your Roots Tech used to be kind of a separate website. Now it's actually part of familysearch.org. So you can search and view over a thousand recorded video sessions on uh, from 19 from 2021 and 2022 um, <clears throat> there is some kind of exp ex expectation that this may continue these may continue to be offered at least on a limited basis and they are also available on the uh, on the family search youtube channel they're in two different categories there are those that can be viewed directly from uh, in youtube you do search for family search and they'll be right on youtube there are others that you have to come to the rootstech.org website. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm starting to get a little some spring um, results of the spring and flowers. Um, this is the, that you'll only be able to see those through coming to the rootstech.org website. So if you come here, you can search them all and view them. If you go onto YouTube, they'll be basically invisible. Even though it says watch on YouTube, it won't be there. So there's uh, there's kind of, uh, that's just an idea of how you get to all this additional information. Um, there's also some completely revised uh, areas we have under the, once again, under the question mark, you have the family search community. Uh, this is kind of a forum, open forum, where you can ask information. And uh, you really need to be signed into this separately from Family Search so that you're, you get notification of when somebody responds to you. So you need that kind of information. Then we have a newly redesigned, re-re-redesigned, about the fifth iteration of this, of the Family Search Help Center. Um, and there are some, and those are the, the the kinds of things that are covered in here. The only problem is that searching the help center is sometimes frustrating. This is why I keep mentioning that everything on the family search is available through a Google search. Um, and so I would encourage you if you really, for beef before you get to the help center, just go look on Google and put in your question and see if you've come up with the answer on family search. It may save you some time and some effort. Um, there's also an area called groups. Uh, that's within the um, 
uh, communities. And those are specific research areas or research groups. And you can connect and be in, in part of one of those research groups. They are sort of modeled after the ones that are on Facebook. Uh, they, the activity and the responsiveness of these groups would be dependent on, on who's there and, and what their commitment is. There's also a part where you can suggest an idea to, uh, to family search. Uh, that's also under the uh, community area. And so I would think this is another thing that people would like to be looking at. Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to be here and talk a little bit. There's, uh, there's a lot more complicated areas of, of the Family Search website that are being affected by the changes. Uh, and uh, we'll be covering those in, as things, uh, as we get more focused on the Family Search uh, website. And one of the things that Catherine Grant, who presented just before I did here in this, this uh, particular date, uh, has gone into those family search things in, in much, much greater detail.